Okay. Everybody bring it in. Bring it in, bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. Here we go. Well, I didn't mean literally. So. All right, you guys got your notes? You got your pens? You got everything? There's a lot in those notes, but tonight I want you to turn to the actual note section that has scripture on one side and notation on the other. And we're going to dig into this. Okay. Um, Our series is called... Countdown. And two weeks ago we talked about signs of the end times. And then last week we talked about the rapture. And tonight we're talking about the Antichrist. Very good. Okay. What is the name of the MBG, which stands for MBG? MBG. MB. MBG. <laughs> Main bad guy. Oh. Aren't you guys computer game players? The antagonist. Yes, thank you. The antagonist. I like to speak in simpler terms. Main bad guy. Who is the main bad guy in the Hunger Games series? Snow. President Snow. Very good. Hey, David, I'm very proud of you for knowing that. President Snow. Okay. Now, President Snow. A uh, good guy. I just called him an MBG. Oh, he's pretty bad, right? Like, what is, what's the big thing he does that's bad? He tries to kill people. He tries to kill people. He, he succeeds at killing people. What? He puts people against each other. He lies and incites violence amongst people for no reason. Yes. Very good. Well, I've got... Hey, rein in your attention. Rein in your attention. I've got news for you. The Antichrist is going to make President Snow look like Bambi. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. The Antichrist is going to make President Snow look like Bambi. In your notes, I have the scripture for tonight. It's Revelation 13, 1 through 10. If you have a Bible, turn there. Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. I'm going to read the first four verses, and we're going to delve into that. Because I have the most amount of points that I have ever given before. I have... 14, and 13 of those come out of verses 1 through 4, and it's all characteristics, features about the Antichrist. Wait, we'll get to questions in a minute. I have a regular vocabulary word question. Uh-huh. All right. So, here's God's word from Revelation 13. And I saw, this is John, the apostle, writing, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave its, his power and his throne and its great authority. One of the heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast and who can fight against it? Now, if you haven't picked up already, Revelation, the book of Revelation, is full of allegory or symbolic language. John uses symbols to communicate literal events and literal people. And the problem is you've got to kind of sift through and wondering, well, what is he really talking about? What do these symbols represent? Now, I want to tell you guys right up front that Revelation has many different views of interpretation. There are people who approach this book differently, good, godly people who approach this book differently. Personally, and I'm going to be teaching what I believe it's talking about, and the reason I'm going to be sticking with with my view and not trying to explain all the others is because we'd be here all night. So I'm going to just show you guys, if you want to, I, I encourage you, study this further if you're curious, well, what do the other views believe? Study them further. And maybe during like question time, if you want to, maybe we can dig into that a little bit. But I believe what's called the futurist perspective. And the futurist perspective believes that Revelation is talking about literal people, literal events that will happen in the future. That's what I believe. And so the problem is we've got to sit here and go, okay, well, what do these things represent? This beast and these horns and these diadems and the leopard and the bear and all this. What does it represent? Okay, 
So I'm going to give you the interpretation of a futurist position on the book of Revelation. Everybody confused yet? All right, good. Question or just, yeah, okay, <laughs> confused. All right. So 14 things from Revelation 13, 1 through 10, 13 of them are coming out of the first four verses. Here we go. You ready with this, Mackenzie? All right. Beast. He's called a beast because of his wild, uncontrolled nature. The beast is the Antichrist. The beast is the Antichrist, and he's called a beast because of his wild, uncontrolled nature. One of the, one of the uh, theologians that I was reading pointed out that the, the beast contrasts with Jesus, who's represented as a lamb. And that's pretty interesting. Think about that for a second. Jesus is the lamb who came to be our sacrifice. The beast is just this wild, out-of-control person who's taking power. The sea. Look at verse 1. I saw a beast rising out of the sea. The sea here most likely represents that he's a Gentile. He is most likely a Gentile. Now, what's a Gentile? Non-Jew. Somebody who's non-Jew. So that's really specific. He could be... Of any nation on earth except Israel. So we can really narrow it down. He's, uh, yeah, the sea there and in, in other places in scriptures can represent nations. So coming out of the sea is this idea of coming from the Gentiles. The horns means he will have power. The horns with ten horns, it says, and seven heads. With ten horns, that represents that he's going to have power. Um, in the Bible times, horns was connected to power because animals fought, and still fight today, with their horns. You know, you've seen bucks, deer, fighting together with their horns. Same idea. You know, they got rams and things in Israel, and they would use their horns to fight, so horns was symbolic of power. Heads. He's said to have seven heads. Heads will be the nations that will band together to support him. The nations, and it doesn't mean there'll be seven nations, it means that there'll be many nations. There'll be a lot of nations. In fact, most of the world is going to get behind this guy when he arrives on the scene to support him as he ascends to power. Diadems is possibly pointing to his global dominion. The diadems is possibly um, referring to his global dominion. What he's going to try to do, and I don't know if you guys are aware of this, the Antichrist is going to show up and he's going to try to set up a one world government. And, and most of the earth is going to be behind him. Um, by the way, I meant to define antichrist. You guys know what anti means? Okay. Opposite, yeah. Non, yeah. So if he's an antichrist, then he's the opposite of Jesus. Good. Good. Marquise, you're bringing it tonight. Love it. All right, blasphemous names. What's blasphemy? I don't know. That was my question. Oh, like jewels? Diadems? Yeah. You're welcome. What <laughs> if yeah, if you have any questions, jump in. What, uh, what is blasphemy? What? Okay, claiming to be God when you're not. Yeah, yeah, it's cursing God. So the blasphemous names, he will exalt himself above God. The blasphemous names, he's going to exalt himself. Above, he's basically going to claim deity. I am God is going to be his uh, war cry. Ma'am. Yeah, absolutely, because it's, it's demeaning the name of God. Yeah, good, good question. All right, let's get into these animals. Leopard, that's represent, representative of he will have a great army. Bear, he will be fierce and strong. Let me slow down, make sure you have time to write that. Leopard, he will have a great army. Bear, he will be fierce and strong. Lion, he will use powerful words. It describes it here, let me read it for you. And I saw the beast was like a leopard... Its feet were like bears, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. So he's going to have a great army, he's going to be fierce and strong, and he's going to have powerful words, words that he's going to use to convince and deceive the world. When you think about it, this guy is going to have such powerful speech, the ability to just really make you get on his team. Scary. Because he's going to talk in such a way that if you stop and think about this, if he's trying to set up a one world government, he's going to take, think about the nations around the world that are constantly at war. This guy's going to show up and then all of a sudden he's going to talk in such a way that they're going to be like, let's get on board with this guy. Nations that have been fighting for hundreds of years 
are suddenly going to be, let's join together and get behind this guy. That takes one crazy person to be able to pull that off. So how does he pull that off? Well, look at verse 3. Wait, I'm jumping ahead. Verse verse 2 again. And to it, the Antichrist, the dragon gave his power and his great throne and great authority. Okay, who's the dragon? Satan, very good. The dragon is Satan who will be the source of the Antichrist's power. The dragon is Satan who will be the source of the Antichrist's power. So Satan, who is very powerful, more powerful than God? That was very weak. More powerful than God? Okay, good. More powerful than God? No, but very powerful. And God has given Satan a certain amount of authority in this world, and Satan is going to use that to empower the Antichrist and be able to unite the world. Mortal wound, verse 4. No, verse 3. And one of the heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. The mortal wound here probably refers to him receiving a mortal wound. How did I write that? Yeah, receive a mortal wound, but he'll be healed. Now, what's a mortal wound? What? Deadly wound. Some actually theorize that maybe he will appear to even die and resurrect. After all, he's an antichrist, so trying to imitate Christ would be something that he's going to try to do. So, the suspect there is not really clear exactly what the mortal wound is going to look like or how it's going to affect him, but he's going to appear to him at least should die and not die, or to appear to have died and come back. Now, if somebody does that, heals from a mortal wound or comes back from the quote-unquote dead, that's going to amaze people. You stop and think about that for a second. If if we saw that in the news and suddenly there's this guy who should have been dead or he died and came back, it's going to be crazy in the news and it's going to astound people and they're going to think this guy has some kind of powers. Maybe some people will say, this is the, we finally have an actual superhero. Who knows? (coughs) It's going to be absolutely insane. Continuing, uh, and the whole earth marveled as they followed him. The earth, so he's going to receive worldwide attention. He's going to receive worldwide attention. This guy is going to be all over the place. Think about YouTube Live and Facebook Live and all the news. He's going to be like all over the place, in your face, magazines. He's going to make, so uh, younger generation, what's, who's a big celebrity right now? Uh, Who? Dwayne Johnson. Really? Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. Sinatra. (laughs) What? LeBron? Okay. The Antichrist is going to dwarf LeBron. Dwarf him in popularity. In popularity. Absolutely dwarf him in popularity. Worldwide attention. And 13. Look at verse 4. And they, talking about the earth, worshipped the dragon, for he had given authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? He's going to be worshipped. He's going to be worshipped. He's, he's going to receive so much attention. He's going to be talked about so much. He's going to be revered that it's going to be a worship of him. Now, this is interesting because they're going to worship the dragon, which is Satan, because he had given authority to the beast. What did Satan want from Jesus? Yeah, praise. What? To bow down to him. Satan wanted worship. Satan craves worship. And he's finally going to get it. Not from Jesus, not from Christians, but from the rest of the world. He's finally going to get it. All right, so there's 13 things. I'm going to wait for a second on the 14th. 13 things about the Antichrist that we can decipher from this passage of Scripture. Now, does this sound like a nice guy? Really? I mean, this guy, you know, either heals or comes back from the dead. He's trying to set up a one-world government. He's going to what? He's going to be suave and charming. Absolutely. He's going to be able to talk like you've never heard. He's going to be able to convince you that he's right. But what does he do? Look at verse 5. 
And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Do the math. 42 months. Do the math. Three Three and a half years. Thank you. Three and a half years. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, cursing against God, making itself equal with God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven, specifically, probably, angels. Verse 7, also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life, uh, the book of, of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear. Now stop right there. What's he going to do? He's going to do a lot of things, but I'm focusing the last point on one thing. War, he will make war against Christians. He will make war against Christians. One of his big pushes is that he is going to try to eradicate Christians. And guess what? He's going to do a pretty good job. Yes, it is. Now, we talked about the rapture last week. Do you remember when the rapture is going to happen? Before, during, or after the tribulation. So before, during, or after this time period. I say before, during, or after because I have no idea when. The Bible doesn't tell us. But it's going to happen. And we know that there will be Christians in the tribulation because he's going to be killing them. Does that mean that we who were Christians before the Antichrist showed up are here on earth or that people who saw the rapture became Christians? I don't know. But there are going to be Christians on the earth and the Antichrist is going to be slaughtering them. (laughs) So if you and I do live to see this day, then it's very, very likely that you and I, if we're passionately pursuing Christ, will be slaughtered for our faith. Yeah. It is scary. That's why I'm going to turn to the next section. Okay. So this is a great message. This is a great devotional because there's this guy that's coming that's going to have most of the world on his side. He's going to blaspheme God. He's going to slaughter Christians. All right, let's pray and be done. No. And here's something else, guys. What was the time frame given for him to do this? About three and a half years. Okay, stop and think about it for a second. Countries that have been fighting for centuries are going to come together in as little time as three and a half years. That is light speed of being able to bring the world together. That is light speed. Come on in, guys. Take a seat. He's going to have three and a half years to essentially unite the planet. That is amazing. People have not been able to do that in their own lifetime. And he's going to do it in three and a half years. So, let's go back. I want you guys to read verse 10. If anyone... Is to be, this is talking about Christians, by the way. If anyone is to be taken captive to captivity, he goes. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. It's going to get bad. And if you and I live to see these times, we're going to face really awful <coughs> Bad times. Captivity, possibly. Death, possibly, because we're Christians. And our challenge from God's word is to stand firm. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. We cling to what we believe in Jesus Christ no matter the cost. So I have this question. I want you to answer this in your head. Do you love and trust Jesus so much that you'd be ready to die for him? Do you love him and trust him and believe in him to the point that you'd be willing to die? Because many will die for their faith. We might be among them, depending on when Jesus comes, depending on when these things happen. We might be among them. Are you ready? If you are, and if you can answer that right now in your head, you can answer that and say, absolutely, I'm ready to die for my faith. Great. I am too. So let's pray for each other 
and let's endure together and let's strengthen each other. If you're not, and if you're freaked out, then I would ask you this. What's keeping you from being willing to die for your faith? Is it maybe that you're not a Christian? That you've never put your faith and trust in Christ? That you've never received His gift and been freed from sin? From sin? Is that it? Or is it that you are a Christian, you're just flat out scared? And I can understand that. Yeah, I can understand that. So we need to be praying for strength and we need to be continuing to pour into each other because bad times are coming, whether we live to see them or not, and we need to be ready. Just like our tagline says, time is running out. All right, let's pray and then we'll do some questions. God, thank you so much for your word and your truth, for loving us. Lord, I want to be absolutely 100% ready to die for the faith that I believe in for you. And I pray for your strength to do that. And God, where I am weak and where we are weak, will you strengthen us? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, question time. Victoria. Wait, so the Antichrist is going to be human, right? Yes. He will not be animal or vegetable or mineral. No, he will be human. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, one at a time. Uh, why were there no subpoints? Because. Okay. Second question. <laughs> yes. Uh, how can we, like, like, how do you know how to interpret this? Yes. Did the early church interpret it yeah. like this and they just held to that belief? Actually, how in... Can we approach Actually, in some ways, the early church did not. There was a lot of argument as to what it represented. But a lot of interpretation comes from um, elsewhere in scriptures. So you use Bible to interpret the Bible. So you've got uh, Daniel chapter 7, which talks about the four beasts that represented the nations that were coming before Christ. And so you can use some of that same methodology there. You've got Matthew 24, and you've got First and Second Thessalonians. And if you kind of put the themes of Scripture together, you can use Scripture to interpret Scripture. Some of it is speculative, and that's why I use the word probably sometimes, because some of it is speculative. Uh, okay, So you said, like, you have a futuristic view? Yes, I do. What are the other Thank you. Okay, I'm not super knowledgeable, but I will answer as best I can. So there's the historic view of Revelation that kind of believes that these things already happened in different ways. Um, I'm not versed on the details of why they think that or, or what they would plug into that, but they would plug other things that happen throughout history with uh, Rome and with some of the other things that happen throughout our history to say that these things happened more, uh, yeah, something like that. And by the way, people have wondered who the Antichrist was. We don't know who he's going to be, but people have thought, like when, uh, when Hitler came on the scene, people thought this has got to be the Antichrist. And that makes a lot of sense. If you think about the horrible things that he did, but he didn't fit all these categories, and obviously he wasn't because he, he died. He did. He slaughtered Jews. Absolutely. Good question. Um, okay, so the historic view. There's what's called the spiritualist view, which says that the events talked about in the Revelation are not literal. So there's not a literal person as the Antichrist, but they're more of an influence. So they would say that we're kind of going through a tribulation now with the influence that the world is having, and it's not a literal seven years that there's other things that are going on that are, it's more of a spiritual, it's more of an influence, it's not, it's not literal people, it's more figurative. Does that make sense? Cool. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> Half thought, I get it. Yeah. Um, how does this relate to the anti-antichrist? Oh, like little a antichrists? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So, yeah, I meant to say something like that. Yeah, so there is the Antichrist, Big A, who is personal, I believe, a, an actual human who's going to come and unite the earth against Christian. And then there's, what, there's what's called little a Antichrists, which we talked about this um, a couple of weeks ago in John 24, the people who come and claim to be Jesus. Uh, we talked about that. There's a lot of them. Um, I forget one of the ones that I showed you guys, but there was a guy that um, he, t he's alive today, and he's running around saying that he is Jesus. Okay, he is a little a Antichrist. Oh, running around. Yeah, and there's lots of them. If you, if I did a Google search of people who said they're Jesus, and there was like a list of hundreds of people, and I was like, you got to be kidding me. There's this many? And yeah, yeah, so there. Good. 
No, thank you. Other questions? <laughs> oh, Sam. Okay, so God hates sin, though. You know? Yes. Why would he let Satan be the Yes. Oh, that, that is an awesome question. Okay. I will try to satisfy because I don't have all the answers here. Because even I'm asking, God, why would you do this? Or why are you letting, even today, like p- wicked people doing things, why are you letting this happen? But I can say this. God allows sin for a season. He allows it for a season. And I, I, I believe part of what's going on with the Antichrist and the tribulation is that God is saving specifically the Jews. He's showing the Jews through the Antichrist's wickedness that Christ did already come in the form of Jesus. And, 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 and a lot of people believe, and I, I agree with them, that Israel will see that, hey, we missed it because they're still waiting for the Messiah. We missed it. It was Jesus. And so God will use this time of great wickedness to further save his people. Does that make sense? Cool. Yes, ma'am. I call no on that. Okay, she calls no on that. I do, because the thing no is, on what? is the whole, uh, why does God allow evil? Okay. It's not that he's allowing it. He has no control over it. <gasps> really? He's not able to control somebody else who he's also not well with. Chapter and verse, please. Where would it say that? It's not like he's saying. Yeah. What? Chapter and verse. Where would it say that? I don't know. I don't know? I'm just saying. It's You're like, just saying? Here, let me read something for you. You know what? You know what? <laughs> on a surface issue, on a surface level, sure. I could, on a surface issue, I can see where you're coming from, sure. But... When the Bible says this about Jesus, that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and visible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body of the church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, then I just have to say, no, he does have control. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's okay to disagree. That's absolutely well, okay. I disagree. It's okay. It's just like God and the devil are two different people. The devil's way worse than God. But at the same time, God can easily make you as scared as the devil makes you. He could easily take your life from you. God and the devil are completely opposites. I'm more afraid of God, though. But God's up here. And, 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 yeah, go ahead. In the book of Job, Job went through all the suffering at the hands of Satan, but Satan had to get permission from God to do that. Thank you. That's a great example. No yes. So all the BS we go through is because God's letting that happen? Because well, he's giving the Satan permission? Well, let me ask you something. How else would free will work? How could you have free will and yet God directs everything? How is it free will if nothing's free? Free is in... Free is in ab- able to do. Like, I'm not <laughs> giving you Satan or God. Yeah. That's your free will. Oh. But also Romans 8.28 says... God, it's been a while since I've been here. I'm paraphrasing, but Good. God, God, does all things, God does all things to um, the glory of God. For all, for all things work together for good, for the glory of God. Uh, for the, yes. So yes. So, so the pur- this, his purpose in all those things is for good, so we may love him more. And... For other reasons, we might not even know. Right. If God always stepped in, when I was about to do something stupid or somebody was about to do something hurtful or harmful to me, if God always stepped in, then then I would not have free will to make my own choices because God would be making my choices for me. And two, I would not learn the consequences of sinful actions. And God wants me to learn, hey, if you do this, it's going to hurt. And so he allows it to happen. Like, hey, if you put your hands on this burn, that's going to burn you. It's going to burn you. What's that, Aaron? I said, if God's always there to just fix all the bad stuff, why not all of you be in heaven? That's actually, that's a very good point. Yes. That's a very good point. Somebody else? Another question. Sam. Sam, sorry. All right, so you said, uh, like, the Jews are, like, God's chosen people, right? Correct. And so, is that, like, I mean, like, the like, more favorites in the point of heaven? No. Um, when God chose Abraham, Genesis chapter something, then he chose Abraham, he was going to make him a great nation. He called him my chosen people. 
uh, not because God loved them more than he loves the rest of the world, but that through them he was going to provide the Messiah. Through them God was going to set up his laws, give the Ten Commandments, give the, uh, the, the, books of the books of Moses, and set up this is what the tabernacle is going to worship, this is what the temple is going to look like, and this is how you're going to operate. Why? Because it's all pointing to a Messiah who's going to come and set it right. So he chose the Jews uh, to fulfill um, his promise to bring Christ and so he's given them that title, his chosen people. And he hasn't forgotten about them. The gospel has, when Jesus Christ died and when um, in Acts chapter 2, when the church was born, it was meant not just for the Jews but for the entire world. And so the Gentiles now have an opportunity to come in and to be saved. And God's allowing that to happen. But near the end of Revelation, he's going to come back to his people Israel and say, I haven't forgotten you. Make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, but you were doing it very thoughtfully. <laughs> you have something? No. Oh, man, man. It is scary. But you guys know what I talked about a couple of weeks ago. I talked about, hey, don't worry, don't be fearful, because all of this bad stuff is going to happen. But if you have your faith in Jesus Christ, you are secure. And even if they do take your life, you're going to heaven. Oh yeah, when, like, it's awful. Last, like, when we talk about 9-11 and stuff, I cry because oh, yeah. like, all that bad stuff happened. Mm -hmm. And so just knowing that so many people are going to get hurt, including innocent people like Christians, just knowing people are going to get hurt like that makes me sad. Sure. Knowing, like, the world's going to get destroyed. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, breakout. Dudes across the way, non-dudes, stay here. <laughs>